high blood sugar can damage what's called ApoB100, which is a receptor on your uh, LDL cholesterol, which your liver recognizes mm -hmm. and sucks it and pulls it into your liver. Because that's what LDL is doing. It's transporting you know, fat cholesterol around your body and it's going to your liver and your liver is using it. The higher your HDL is compared to your triglycerides, the better you are. So if your HDL and your triglycerides are sort of one to one, it's sort of HDL to triglycerides ratio, then your low, low likelihood of, of developing heart disease. The better that gets, the higher LDL gets. So like two to one HDL to triglycerides, you're in very, very low risk of getting heart disease. Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. How is it that there is such a crazy contrast between both camps when it comes to cholesterol and unsaturated saturated fat? Yeah, so it, it's purely from, you know, the, the, the muddy literature. Yeah, and, and the scientific literature is very... Uh, divergent in this, but the the reason is that all all well, a lot of the original studies showing or at least claiming that saturated fat and cholesterol cause a problem was all industry research. It was all funded by the sugar companies, uh, and actually they didn't disclose that they didn't they didn't disclose their sources and their funding, which is not ethical or legal. And um, but they did it, and so people like Ansel Keys were were paid off by the sugar companies. He put out. You know, the Seven Nations study, which um, is pretty pretty well established now. He doctored the evidence. He withheld. He cherry-picked the certain ones that fit the graph that made it look like more cholesterol equaled more heart disease. And again, that's associative study. Um, it's, it's epidemiology. It's You can only show association. You can never show causation, right, with an association study. So, and, you know, I talk to people sometimes. They're like, well, no, it's such a strong correl— you know, this, 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 all these correlative studies prove causation. Okay, so this is someone who's never studied statistics because you can never prove causation from correlation. You cannot, by definition. So, but if you prove or show that there is no correlation, that proves there is no causation, right? Because if there's no association, obviously that one's not causing the other. So his own studies took out a number of countries that had very high cholesterol and saturated fat intake and very low heart disease and other ones that had very low saturated fat and cholesterol intake and very high heart disease, right? So it really showed a very different uh, picture. So he, he you know, uh, uh, doctored his own research and uh, because he was paid off and, uh, and was a bit of a crook. I don't really like, some people still say, well, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. He actually did a lot of good research and we should, we should at least still accept that. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> like we thought that was good research too. We found out it was compromised. So what else was compromised? I don't think we can trust really anything that guy did. Um, and then uh, the you know, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco Medical School, they published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016, one of the top medical journals in the world, actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in like the 50s and 60s detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies Damn. to make it appear as if cholesterol was causing heart disease uh, when actually there was a lot of studies actually showing a very strong association between sugar and heart disease, right? And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And he was the one who authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease, saturated fat increased cholesterol, stop eating both. And that changed the world. And then after that, we're like, well, we know that cholesterol causes heart disease. We know that saturated fat increases cholesterol. Therefore, they're bad. And then you started looking at things, like, well, how can this reduce cholesterol? Because we know reducing cholesterol is good, right? So all you have to do is look at, does it reduce cholesterol? But then some bright spot said, well, what is it actually doing? You're reducing cholesterol, but is that actually good? Is that actually coming out with the, with the outcomes that you want? So there are studies showing that when you replace saturated fat with linoleic acid, that yes, that will reduce your LDL cholesterol and cardiac deaths go up, right? So that's not really helpful, right? Because the point is not to fight cholesterol. The point was to fight heart disease. And we found that that intervention did reduce cholesterol, but actually increased heart disease. And there have been a number of studies, ugh, really in the last decade, mm -hmm. with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people showing that higher LDL cholesterol is actually beneficial. So people over the age of 65 with higher levels of LDL cholesterol live longer, live more longer independently, 
right? So they're not going to nursing homes, they're not getting dementia. It's protective against Alzheimer's, protective against Parkinson's and, and other forms of dementia. Higher LDL cholesterol. Yeah, it's protective. Mm. Yeah. Your brain's made out of cholesterol. Yeah. Your brain's made out of fat. 70% of the solid matter in your brain is fat. 20% of that is DHA, EPA. That only comes from animal sources. You can't get those from plants. We don't, we make it, but not much, right? You need, you need more of it. That cholesterol, your axons, which is like the, you know, the fiber optic wires coming down from your neurons connect with the rest of your body. Those are insulated like any, any sort of wires would be. And uh, with this, what's called a myelin sheath and that helps the conductivity that, sh that, that makes the signal go faster. So you get demyelination, uh, you get demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis and that uh, manifests with multiple neurological problems. That just comes from damaging that myelin sheath. Well, that myelin sheath is made out of fat and cholesterol, mm. right? You need all these things. These things are very important. In fact, just being on a ketogenic diet is very beneficial too because the ketones can cross the blood-brain barrier and then reconstitute into uh, fats. And that actually is, helps build the physical structures and maintain the physical structures of the brain. So when we take a deeper look into this, A, historically, a lot of these studies were now known to be fraudulent and compromised. They were bought and paid for by the sugar companies that was not disclosed. We, we even have their contracts. We know what these Harvard professors were paid. They were paid $6,500. It's equivalent about 50 grand now. That's it. That's what their souls were worth. They bought a Camry, right? You know, so like, they got that and they, and they, and they it just absolutely destroyed the health of the world, you know? And we know since that declaration, people have gotten a lot worse. The obesity rate after World War II was 6%. And in 1980, it was 8%. Now it's like over 24%, something like that. 70% of people are overweight or obese in America. UK was 6%, 6%. Now it's like closer to 30%. So, you know, we've tripled, quadrupled our um, uh, obesity rates, right? And all the other chronic diseases have, have gone along with that. Um, there's another one. I learned about the Framingham study, major, major, major study, sort of a hallmark, landmark case uh, study uh, in, in heart disease and cholesterol. Followed these people in, uh, like, was it Framingham, Massachusetts, uh, for I think it was like 30 years, looked at all these different sorts of markers and, um, and, and looked at you know, what sort of problems they were getting and see what sort of associations they could draw. And I was taught in medical school that this showed that the more cholesterol that you had, total cholesterol, LDL, LDL cholesterol you had, uh, the, the higher your heart disease rates were. It was just sort of this direct correlation. Okay, again, correlation, not causation. The problem with that is what's taught to, you know, like I said, you get these things, you just get repeat and you repeat and you repeat and they just end up being, oh, everyone knows that. But you look back to the source and, and you find that like, okay, what's that based on? So that was based on the AHA, their interpretation of the, the Framingham study, not the Framingham study itself. So the American Heart Association actually published two years after the Framingham study that more cholesterol equaled more heart disease. What the Framingham study actually showed was that more cholesterol, less heart disease. That's what they found. So they, they completely um, misreported the, the actual findings of the Framingham study. So this, this all goes back to this fraud that was perpetrated first onto the American public and then later onto the world because we were obviously very influential in uh, other policies around the world. Like we made that declaration in 1977. UK followed suit in 1983. And the, and the same results happened to them as happened to us. And then Australia and the rest of the world have all been taking these... these. Uh, and these are ways just to increase selling processed foods, most likely, and yeah. monocrop farming and whatever else you want to yeah, I mean, throw into the mix. That's it, because this is all industry research that we didn't know. You know so, so the only thing you can tell from industry research is that whatever the industry is funding, they will mm -hmm. fu that, that, that study will support that, you know, that industry, that product. And in fact, studies that come out that, that, they've, that industry supports that don't support their product, they don't get published, mm -hmm. right? So they might find this and go like, whoop, that didn't show what we want to show. We'll just tuck this under the rug. I actually spoke with a, a doctor down in, in Perth, Australia, where I live now, and he was involved in research for uh, probiotics, 
and um, I didn't. He didn't tell me the name of the of the company or anything like that. But so it was a it was a major probiotic company, and they had a small study with sort of like six people, which is nothing, uh, showing that there was some benefit to these probiotics. And that's to say, oh, this is clinically proven to to show benefit. Six people, <laughs> and so they wanted a bigger study just because they you know they believed in their product, and that's fair enough. So they say, okay, great, let's do this bigger bigger study, and let's really get some some hard evidence to show that you know our product's great. So they did this bigger study. It was run in Perth, Australia. And they found that actually it wasn't that good. It actually mm-hmm. maybe was, you know, <laughs> detrimental. And so they were getting ready to publish it. And they got, you know, letters from the lawyer saying, that, like, you publish that thing, we'll sue you. And so you, you can't publish it. So they were like, they weren't allowed to publish their results and uh, because it was funded by them. And so the abstract is still available. That's that's available and people can read the abstract, but the full study itself is not allowed to be pu- published. And so that, that's what happens with industry research. So a lot of this stuff that's saying that cholesterol causes heart disease, the, at least the foundational studies mm-hmm. that everyone's based everything off of afterwards, subsequently, uh, was, was industry research, research a lot of these things. There were actually randomized controlled trials back in that era as well because there, there was this was hotly debated. You go back into the liter- literature and, and read the studies and the papers and the position papers, um, you know, in the Journal of American Medical Association, 1956, there was a position that came out um, that I read that said, you know, it, it's basically accepted now that, that cholesterol is a driving factor in heart disease, but this is really based on really bad evidence. There's based these studies that people uh, talk about, they're flawed for all these different reasons. They just went through for like 12 pages, just excoriating all of the so-called evidence that, that cholesterol caused heart disease. So this was hotly debated. And um, all the way through the 70s, and then 1977, that declaration came out. And it was just like, it was, you know, it was appealing to authorities. Well, you know, teacher said so, so no, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And there, there was no argument after that. And it, it actually ruined the reputations and, and careers of all these people, like Dr. Yudkin in the UK. There was just like, no, 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 it's sugar, <clears throat> sugars. There's a, there's a direct correlation um, in every country the when refined sugar consumption goes up, heart disease tracks, you know, like 20 years after that, almost perfectly. Same with seed oils. Seed oils track really well mm-hmm. with heart disease as well. Red meat does not. Animal fats do not. Saturated fat do not. They actually have an inverse relationship. If you look through the, the 20th century, as animal fat, saturated fat is going down, heart disease is going up. And so not the same with with seed oils and sugar. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind check it out using my discount code anthony to get 10 percent off which also applies to subscriptions giving you 25 percent off total all right thanks guys so i don't think you can argue that saturated fat and, and cholesterol are causing that because we're reducing all of those things and we have all these studies uh that, that show the opposite so there were, there were actual randomized controlled trials the, the, again there's like that intervention trial that i said with um linoleic acid they replaced saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat and they got worse outcomes. They had people getting more heart attacks, more cardiac events, even though their, their, their cholesterol was lowered. And, and now there's more and more and more studies and evidence showing that LDL cholesterol is actually really good for you. It's, it's natural. We make it. Right? First of all, there's hundreds of particulates. So LDL is not just one molecule. There's just, just dozens of these things. And they can be damaged and they can be destroyed. And so... I think it's more of a surrogate marker of other sorts of damage and disruption when you get these bad LDL things. We call them bad. I don't think they are bad themselves. LDL itself is not bad. LDL itself is very good. Mm-hmm. You know, you can think of, uh, you know, Dr. Ken Berry says that, you know, LDL cholesterol is the good cholesterol. LDL is the other good cholesterol. They're both good. They're both beneficial. Through oxidation, glycation, having a lot of carbohydrates in your diet, High carbohydrates in your, or just carbohydrates in your diet in general is, is not optimal, I don't think, because when your blood sugar goes up, then 
uh, this can actually cause direct damage in your body. Those glucose molecules can actually physically fuse to other molecules in your body and permanently damage them. It's called glycation. So it's a non-enzymatic binding of that glucose molecule or a sugar molecule to other molecules. This is what, it, what you might hear like an HbA1c. This is what diabetics talk about. That's a, that's a direct glycation end product from, from glucose sticking to hemoglobin. But the other uh, other carbohydrates do as well. Fructose does this as well, but in different ways. It doesn't it doesn't show up as, as on an HbA1c, but they'll have other sorts of you know um, uh, glycation um, you know, byproducts. So that causes direct damage. Mm-hmm. And but when you say permanently, what do you mean? Yeah. So so it'll it'll bind there. Mm-hmm. It'll damage that molecule, and our body can't fix that. So it has to just recycle it, right? So so HbA1c is a marker of how much your blood sugar level has been for the last three months mm-hmm. because you'll, you'll turn over your red blood cells and all your hemoglobin in those red blood cells every three months, right? Okay. So once they get a bit dodgy, your spleen will, there's these little tiny little tubules that they go through and they actually have to fold in half and go around these little corners. And if they sort of get stuck and, and, and pause or something like that, they can't, they can't manipulate that, the spleen will pluck them up and, and eat them and, and recycle them. So you sort of constant turnover of your red blood cells about every three months. And so you you can see this turnover in your hemoglobin as well. And you can see how damaged it's been. And that's sort of a marker of the rest of the damage that's going on in your body. And so that happens to other things. So this is what this is what kills diabetics is just this chronic elevated uh, blood sugar. And you know, as, as Lane Norton would say, well, high blood sugar is really playing the long game, isn't it? That diabetes is a bit of a joke, right? And like, no, this, this, this causes damage and it builds up over decades, right? And so that's what we see. And this is, this is what damages diabetes, by diabetics and kills diabetics is this chronically high blood sugar. So that's, that is also damaging other things in your body like LDL cholesterol. So high blood sugar can damage what's called ApoB100, which is a receptor on your uh, LDL cholesterol, which your liver recognizes mm-hmm. and sucks it and pulls it into your liver. Because that's what LDL is doing. It's transporting, you know, fat cholesterol around your body and it's going to your liver and your liver is using it. And if your liver can't recognize it, it's not going to be able to pull it in. It's not going to be able to utilize it. So now you have more and more and more of this stuff floating around your bloodstream. And where does it go? Well, the only things that can sort of recognize these things and suck them up are your macrophages. They have these scavenger receptors that can basically get anything. And so they start sucking these things up. And sometimes people have heard of, of these foam cells that if you have, you have all this LDL cholesterol and your, uh, your body doesn't know what to do with it, that your macrophages just suck all these things up and they grow and grow and grow. They almost have an unlimited capacity to suck these things up. So they grow into these massive foam cells and they think that's, then these macrophages go to these areas of damage in your artery walls and then they try to repair that because that's their job and then they get stuck there. That's the thought. That's what people think might be happening. So they say, oh, if you have high LDL cholesterol, then you'll develop these foam cells. No, you won't develop those foam cells if you don't damage your LDL cholesterol first. And that comes from that you know, high levels of, of blood sugar uh, and possibly seed oils and other sorts of pro-inflammatory uh, things as well could do that. So you can look at your LDL and you actually get particulate studies. And it's just literally dozens, if not over a hundred, um, you know, different kinds of LDL damaged and undamaged and things like that. So I think those, those damaged LDL cholesterols, I, I still don't think those are causing the disease, they might be taken up by these foam cells. Those foam cells may get stuck in your arterial walls. I don't think we've really proven that one way or the other. There's other theories um, to do with the origin of, of, of heart disease. Mm-hmm. But either way, that LDL, that damaged LDL, is, isn't causing the problem. It's just, it's just being taken up as in this larger inflammatory disease process. So I think it's more of a surrogate marker like HbA1c for the rest of the damage that's going on on in your body. And, and, that, and that's the thing too. LDL cholesterol is very weakly associated with heart disease. Those damaged LDL cholesterol particulate, like it's called SDLDL, the small dense LDL, large buoyant LDL, they're, they're not even associated with heart disease at all. They're just good for you. Um, well, you know, according to, to most sources, SDLDL, small dense LDL, those are the damaged LDL that have been, you know, screwed around by the glycation and oxidation. That has a stronger association with heart disease, but it's really only like 1.5 times 
more association. So it's, it's still quite a weak association. Diabetes is 10 times increased risk for, for heart disease, right? So that's a massive, massive difference, right? So your HbA1c is actually a stronger indicator of your risk for heart disease than your LDL is, even, even your SDLDL, right? Metabolic syndrome. Someone has metabolic syndrome, not full, full-blown diabetes. They're six times more likely to develop heart disease. LDL is really, you know, just even SDLDL mm -hmm. is really not what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on reducing inflammation, reducing our, our carbohydrates, our, our HbA1c, our, our diabetes. And, and, and there are clinical trials uh, by Professor Steve Finney showing that you can fully reverse type 2 diabetes by putting people on a ketogenic diet. Get them off of medication, get them off insulin. And I've seen that in practice. I've seen my, my own mom when she went on a carnivore diet. She was a type 2 diabetic for 25 years. She was on three different oral medications and was on a high dose of insulin. Within two months, she came off all of her med oral medications and down to a minimal dose of, of insulin. And her, and her doctor and her HbA1c went from, you know, 9, which is very high, down to 6.1, which is, you know, high normal for a non-diabetic. And her doctor looked at her and just said, how the hell did you do this? What the hell did you do? You know, mm -hmm. diabetes is a progressive disease. It only gets worse. You know, we, we can mitigate it and slow it down with diet, lifestyle, medications, and so on, but it only gets worse. It never just gets, it never just reverses like this. What the hell did you do? And so she told her about what I was doing and my thoughts on, on what we should be eating. And she was like, you know, I'd really like to, you know, to, to see his research and, and have a chat. So we, you know, we talked for like an hour and a half. She's a very bright lady. You know, she's the MD, PhD from, from Harvard, has a PhD in biochemistry from Harvard. And I was like Your saying- Your mom? Um, the, her doctor. Her doctor, okay. And, uh, and, and so I was explaining to her, I was like, look, I think we're looking at biochemistry all wrong. You know, we're calling this a fed state, this a fasting state. I don't, I don't think that's right. I think our so-called fasting state is our primary metabolic state. That's where all of our heavy machinery come to bear and just talking about the different biomechanics of, to do with our biochemistry and, and diabetes. And she's just like, yeah, right. Well, okay, getting off these medications, we're going to do this. <laughs> like, that's right. So she just, you know, really revamped her whole practice yeah. based on that as well. And, and that has been borne out by the literature. I mean, there, there, there are published studies, intervention trials showing you can reverse type 2 diabetes and get people off insulin and their medications by just putting on a ketogenic diet, not even a full-blown you know, carnivore diet, just ketogenic, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's where we should be looking. We should be looking at, at reversing diabetes and metabolic syndrome and all those sorts of things as opposed to focusing on these tiny little subset of LDL particulates, which probably are just more the smoke, not the fire. Um, how do you tell if you have the right particulates? Well, you can get particulate studies and you can, you know, you know, dig down that rabbit hole. Or you can just look at your HDL and your triglycerides. If your HDL is in a normal range and triglycerides are in a normal range, you're, you're okay. Um, the higher your HDL is compared to your triglycerides, the better you are. So if your HDL and your triglycerides are sort of one-to-one, -one, so HDL to triglycerides ratio, then you're in very good, you're in very good stead. You're likely, you know, uh, well, you're, you're low, low likelihood of, of developing heart disease the better that gets, the higher LDL gets. So like two to one HDL to triglycerides, you're in very, very low risk of getting heart disease. We know that if you stop eating carbohydrates, stop eating sugar, stop drinking alcohol, your triglycerides will go down. We know if you eat meat and you eat saturated fat, your HDL goes up. When you're working out, lifting weights, that increases your HDL as well. So when I checked my bloods a few years ago, it was just after sort of two, three years of being full on high fat carnivore, my HDL to triglyceride ratio was three to one. Mm -hmm. which is, I mean, I have very low risk of developing heart disease. So that's, I think, I think we're just looking at these things a bit wrong. Also, I think we're just looking at diseases wrong. We're, we're looking at diabetes as a disease, heart disease as a disease, Crohn's as a disease. Really what they are is exposures. We're being exposed to things that are causing us harm. And the treatment for an exposure is removing the exposure. You know, you don't, you don't, treat lead poisoning by just giving them a chelating agent. That's part of it. But you also get rid of the lead pipes and you, you swap out their pipes and you make sure the exposure goes away. So you need to remove the toxicity. You need to remove that toxic exposure and then let your body get on with it. And then there could be medications that can help you along the way, but the main treatment 
is getting that thing away from you. Um, so what should we do with the um, cholesterol reference ranges? Um, mm. I asked because I got my labs done at the beginning of the year. Everything is super green except for the LDL cholesterol, mm-hmm. you know, big bright red thing. Um, yeah. Like, so should we ignore these reference ranges? Like, is a mm. lot of cholesterol like too much? Like, what should we do there? Um, I, yeah, I think I think we do have to sort of relook at all of these things. You know, these reference ranges have come about at a time when we were looking at LDL as if this was this big, bad monster, and it's not. Mm. You know, I think that the evidence has really shown that. Um, there are a number of, of papers that are coming out more recently. There's one with uh, Dr. David Diamond, uh, Dr. Paul Mason, and Professor Ben Bickman. Um that went through all the literature and basically concluded and argued that if your HDL is high and triglycerides are low and you're on a ketogenic diet, you do not need to be on a statin. You don't need to worry about your LDL cholesterol. And I would, I would sort of be in that camp as well. You know, my, my cholesterol, three to one HDL to triglyceride ratio, right? My HDL was, or my LDL was slightly high. I couldn't care less. I just, I just really couldn't because my LDL, the LDL that I have, I mean, there's again, dozens of different kinds of LDL that you can have is all healthy. It's all good for me. It's all good. It's all going to be these large buoyant LDL molecules. So the only thing that would matter is if you had sort of like the SDLDL and, and the other sort of particulates LDL that, that were, you know, more of a, of an indication that you could have other things going on. But I, I, I really do think that this is more smoke, not fire. I don't think that, that even that SDLDL is causing a problem. I think it's more being caught up in, in, in the mix and just being blamed for something, mm-hmm. right? You know, some people say that, you know, it's like, you, you know, you see at these fires, you see all these firemen. So like these damn firemen, we got to get rid of them so we can get rid of these fires, right? Well, they're associated with that, but they're not the cause of it, right? Um, even familial hypertension. So in fact, I saw a presentation from, from David Diamond at uh, Low Carb Denver just this past weekend. Mm-hmm. And he went through all this. And so people say like, well, familial uh, hypercholesterolemia, you have these massive, massive, massive levels of, uh, of cholesterol. And they're like, well, look at these guys. These guys get more heart disease. And actually look at the numbers. It actually doesn't, doesn't square out that, that evenly. As you get older, younger, some, sometimes you have slightly higher uh, risk of, um, if I remember correctly, slightly higher risk of, of heart disease, heart attacks early on. And then as you actually get older, it's exactly the same. So even though I have these massively elevated uh, LDL levels, they don't actually get heart disease in, in, a, in a worse ratio. Also, you know, I mean, they have more LDL to damage if you're doing, you know, if you're eating a whole bunch of stuff that's bad for you. So maybe there, there's something to do there. <clears throat> but I think it was like in the age, age group of like uh, 60 to 70 or 70 to 80, there was actually lower levels. You know, it was actually it was actually beneficial in that in that category, and he found that that a lot of these guys with familial hypercholesterolemia actually had uh, another thing wrong with them that actually made them more hyper hypercoagulable, so they they clot more easily. And then when you separate these things out, uh, and different studies have separated those two out of just just the cholesterol and the clotting factor, there's really just the clotting factor that increased their risk of heart disease, not the LDL. Um, and that's another Dr. Paul Mason. Uh, argues that heart disease is actually a, a disease of clotting. You get damage to the wall of your of your artery, like you can from smoking. This is a major cause of heart disease in general and causes this damage. And, it, and then it clots. And it clots and scars over and clots and scars over and clots and scars over. And that, that's how you get this thickened wall. It's this damage and scarring. I say, well, there's cholesterol in there. But as he points out, every single cell in your body is cholesterol. The cell membrane in our in every single cell we have is made out of cholesterol, right? It's a bilipid layer. What are the lipids? It's cholesterol. And so these red blood cells are going in there. These cells are going in there. They're damaged. They're clotting and they're scarring. And just the cholesterol is left over just from the, you know, the, the, the parts of the cell that were made out of cholesterol. That's what he would argue. Um, and there are other points of evidence like that hypercholesterolemia, familial hypercholesterolemia study pairing those things out that, it was really the clotting issues that were more of a problem than the LDL issues. So it's, it's one of those things we don't really actually have a very good, well, we don't have a definitive cause and reason for heart disease yet. But I, I don't think that you can argue in any way, shape, or form that it's cholesterol in, heart disease out. That does not, sh- that does not bear out by the evidence. In fact, 
there were studies showing that um, there's a study with 140,000 people in America, so a big study, and who all had heart attacks. And they found that literally it was 50-50 had high cholesterol, low cholesterol. So there wasn't even an association one way or the other, right? And so, so again, like, if you don't even have an association that shows that there's no causation, right? You can't prove causation from association, but if there's no association, there's definitely no causation. And one of those numbers being flagged on his uh, blood work is also <laughs> part of a, you know, a giant money machine mm. of being able to prescribe prescription <laughs> drugs. Yeah. Um, even when it comes to your blood glucose levels, for example, uh, you know, they keep moving, they keep moving the field goal posts for stuff like that all the time so that they can yeah. prescribe it to more and more people. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying that things aren't helpful. They could, they could definitely be really helpful, but they, uh, you know, the more people that they can issue these drugs to, uh, the more money they can make. And may, and again, maybe they believe, you know, maybe some of the people behind it believe that this is going to be a healthier way because they're not looking into it maybe as deeply as some other people, but uh, it's definitely it's definitely frustrating because then, you know, you see like a red thing on your mm-hmm. score sheet there when you mm-hmm. have your blood work, and then you talk to Stan Efferding or talk to someone like yourself, and like, ah, oh, it's like kind of a trifecta of things. There's like four or five things we need to look at, and you start to learn it's a, it's a rabbit hole and that you can't, it's hard to know this stuff uh, yourself, and it's hard to, even worse if you're just your average consumer just mm-hmm. trying to get some blood work done because you keep hearing people talk about blood work and you're like, I should get some done. It'd be great to look under the hood. You look under the hood and you get all these red markers mm-hmm. everywhere and you're like, what the fuck? And then maybe mm-hmm. they're not even necessarily high. Maybe in his case, maybe the cholesterol is not even necessarily high, but they keep moving that field goal post mm-hmm. so that uh, they can prescribe drugs. Yeah, and you know, stands are the most... Um they're the, they're the most profitable drugs that's ever been made, you know? And so that was the thing, you know, they, they established or they said they established that cholesterol was bad. And so the only thing is this cholesterol up, heart disease up, right? So you see all these studies from, you know, from Keys and all the other guys who go, as cholesterol goes up, heart disease goes up. Okay. So the only thing that matters is bringing cholesterol down. And so that's what statins are. So they're bringing cholesterol down and they do that. And, and they, might provide other benefits, sort of an anti-inflammatory uh, sort of benefit like aspirin. You know, that's why aspirin is sort of beneficial. And that's that's actually what people think is more likely to be the benefit from from these statins is that it's sort of this mild anti-inflammatory effect, which will probably get a, a much better effect just from taking aspirin and you're not getting a lot of the side effects as well. But there have been studies, I think in 2015, it was like 60,000 people over the age of 65. And again, they found that higher LDL cholesterol, these people were having less cardiac events, less heart attacks, less strokes. People with lower LDL cholesterol were having the worst time of this. The ones that had did the worst were um, low LDL cholesterol uh, and statins. And so, but this was this was sort of, it wasn't, it wasn't like super strong. It wasn't like they were just massively dying off or anything like that. It was like, it was like it, it's either sort of about dead even or maybe a slight, slightly worse. And so the, so the argument, the conclusion and the argument from the authors was like, hey, we really need to rethink, you know, statins and cholesterol here because, you know, from this study, it shows that, that statins are really not doing anything, either neutral or not giving a benefit or even possibly causing detriment. And so why are we doing this? These things have, have side effects. These things have a cost. And so, you know, that's something we should think about. It's certainly not, you know, you're reducing these cholesterol and it's just and it's this massive bonus in, uh, in health. The, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, so this isn't just my opinion. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology published in 2020, a position paper from people who had formerly been very anti-saturated fat. And these same authors then published to say, actually, we did this massive literature review of all the data, and there is really no upper limit on the amount of saturated fat you can eat. It is not associated with heart disease. Full stop. More, more than that, so not full stop, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, they actually found there's an inverse relationship between saturated fat and, heart, and, and stroke. So the more saturated fat people consumed, the lower their stroke rate. 
the less saturated fat they consumed, the higher their stroke rate and no association with heart disease. That's the position of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology right now.